The 1950s was, both critically and commercially, the heyday of Japanese cinema. While films such as Rashomon and Gate of Hell were scooping major awards at international film festivals, and Ishida Honda's Godzilla was becoming a global phenomenon, domestically cinema attendances had reached their all-time peak of 1.1 billion, and the number of films being produced by the country's five major studios was steadily rising until the end of the decade. There was, however, a dark cloud on the horizon. The live broadcasting of the wedding of Prince Akihito in 1959 had caused a huge surge in the sales of television sets, further boosted by the news later that same year that the city of Tokyo would play host to the Summer Olympic Games of 1964. Faced with this new competition, the Japanese film industry slid into decline, by 1964 registering less than half the number of attendances it had enjoyed in its peak a mere six years earlier. To combat this slump, the studios looked for new cinematic directions to entice audiences out of their homes and back into the theatres, including the country's oldest studio, Nikatsu. Nikatsu's production arm had been incorporated into the new Daiei studio in the Japanese government's restructuring of the industry in the 1940s, but the company's theatrical arm had enjoyed huge financial successes in the early 1950s by procuring and exhibiting Hollywood films in its theatres. With a large war chest now at its disposal, Nikatsu re-entered movie production in 1954 and scored considerable successes with first Season of the Sun and then Crazed Fruit, ushering in a new brand of socially transgressive, youth-oriented picture, heavily informed by the American influences which were now permeating young Japanese society and popularising their handsome young star, Yujiro Ishihara. Seeing the potential in the burgeoning teen market, Nikatsu began gearing their focus towards films following Western models, youthful rebels, hard-boiled gangsters, and so-called borderless action films, fronted by their diamond line of handsome male stars. A late arrival to this roster was Joe Shishido. He had made his debut for Nikatsu in 1955, beginning as a character actor, usually playing bad guys as opposed to heroes. In 1957, however, he had undergone plastic surgery on his face, a cheek augmentation procedure intended to make him look more ruggedly handsome, though the result perhaps made him look closer to a chipmunk. When, in 1961, Nikatsu lost two of its major stars, Shishido was called upon to take their roles instead, thereby promoting him into the top rank of the studio's leading man, Diamond Line. Shishido became one of the studio's most prolific performers, appearing in as many as 11 films a year, but today is best remembered for his collaborations with one of Nikatsu's legions of borderless action directors, Seijun Suzuki. Suzuki had joined the studio in 1954, and in the nine years to 1963 had directed 26 films for them in a wide variety of genres, but had become increasingly frustrated with a production line system in which directors were seen as little more than anonymous technicians. Though handed largely formulaic material by the studio and consigned to filming B pictures, he had flirted with a more ambitious visual style in some of his earlier films, such as in Go to Hell Hoodlums, but it would be his work with Shishido which would inaugurate proper his soon-to-be signature aesthetic and tonal approaches. Beginning with 1963's Youth of the Beast, his work took on an increasingly absurdist, surrealist tone, in which narrative clarity frequently played second fiddle to off-kilter framing and editing, and slabs of blackly comic humour. Such stylization reached its apex in 1966's Tokyo Drifter, with its pop-art-influenced canvas of bright colours and wild textures designed by art director Takio Kimura, but this was not to the liking of the Nikatsu higher-ups, who decided to cut significantly the funding for his later pictures. However, when a gap in the studio's release schedule the following year opened up, Suzuki and his writing team set about quickly putting together what would be his 40th film for the company. Branded to Kill would be a Yakuza film like no other, functioning both as a psychological inquiry into the hierarchical nature of organised crime and a blackly comical send-up of the genre itself. Budgetary constraints forced Suzuki to work in black and white rather than his now trademark garish colour, but some extra funding was secured thanks to some minor use of product placement, though the manufacturers of the rice cooker featured in the film perhaps got a little more than they bargained for. The film was released without fanfare as a B picture in the June of 1967, and withdrawn as soon as its initial play dates had finished. Nikatsu's president, Hori Kiyosaku, labelled the film incomprehensible and severed the director's contract with the company at short notice. Though Suzuki would eventually win a court ruling for breach of contract against them in 1971, he found himself persona non grata within the industry and would not make another film for nearly a decade. There the story might have ended, but Branded to Kill has enjoyed a long and prosperous afterlife in the years since its production. 
A series of retrospectives of Suzuki's work in the 80s and 90s resuscitated his reputation, and the dawn of home video made his films available to a new generation of viewers, soon being championed by the likes of Quentin Tarantino and Wong Kar Wai, and paid visual homage to in films such as Park Chan-wook's Old Boy and Jim Jarmusch's Ghost Dog, The Way of the Samurai. Suzuki made his filmmaking comeback in 1980 and continues to work today, albeit sporadically, at the ripe old age of 91. His sequel to Branded to Kill, entitled Pistol Opera, was released in 2001, if anything more extreme than his work in the 1960s, confirming that the singular vision of this strangest of Japanese auteurs remains, after all these years, still undimmed.